today's webinar, which again is entitled Accessing Linked CLSA Data at HDRN Canada Data Centers. Uh, we have a series of presenters. We have Dr. Andrew Costa, Dr. Sophie Hogevin, uh, Carmen La, and Lindsay Gilbert, as well as Anne Hayes, uh, will be joining um, as part of the Q&A. Andrew Costa is an Associate Director of the CLSA, the Canada Research Chair in Integrated Care for Seniors, um, a Schlegel Research Chair in Clinical Epidemiology and Aging in the Department of Health Research Evidence and Impact at McMaster. Um, Sophie Hogevin is the uh, CLSA Data Linkage Coordinator. She works closely with HDRN Canada Data Centers and the DASH team to enable data linkage. Uh, Carmen Lapp. Carmen Law is a program specialist with data access research, the Data Access Support Hub, which is the DASH acronym I've used previously. Um, she is located at the Canadian Institute for Health Information in Toronto. Uh, Lindsay Gilbert has been working with uh, the HDRN uh, since 2019 as part of her role of data services manager in New Brunswick. And finally, Anne Hayes is a health strategy and partnerships executive with over 25 years of experience delivering results through policy research and program initiatives. So there was lots more I could have said about all these presenters. I was trying to uh, add a few quick key highlights. So um, I welcome you all and I'm sorry I didn't do justice to your bios, but I did. I do want to get started for this very exciting uh, webinar today. So over to you, I believe, Andrew. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we will cue slides and get started. That's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> today's, I think, a little bit of a departure from the typical presentation and content format for CLSA webinars, uh, whereas you know, generally uh, these are uh, discrete research presentations. Today, uh, we're extremely excited. It's a milestone for the CLSA and HGRN to announced that um, linked CLSA data are available in multiple provinces for use by Canadian researchers. And so that's really the goal of today. What we want to do today is also just describe um, a bit about the various components that made this possible, overview the CLSA and uh, HDRN's uh, data access support hub, uh, talked about linked data availability, and talk about the process for accessing uh, linked data across jurisdictions. Before I get started, I want to um, uh, highlight a few things. Uh, first, this has been, um, this is ongoing work. And, but what we're presenting today around data availability is the culmination of a multi-year uh, complicated process to uh, securely and within uh, ethical and legal guidelines link the CLSA data to provincial data repositories. And those provincial data repositories, as folks here I'm sure will know, are, are held under provincial legislation and particular privacy rules. Uh, it has been a multi-year, multi-individual um, team effort uh, across jurisdictions to, to get this together. And um, we want to acknowledge everyone's work in, in, in as part of this process uh, and today celebrate it. We continue the work uh, as we go on and we expect that this work will uh, achieve uh, maturity in the next 18 months to two years. And together, as part of CLSA and HDRN, we are going to learn an awful lot um, scientifically, as well as I think procedurally about uh, the process of accessing linked CLSA data. So that's the goal today. But the main announcement is linked CLSA data is available. Uh, to uh, I'll start off by overviewing the CLSA as a study and as a, a national data set. It is difficult to do that in the time I've got a lot of because it is an awful lot of data and it is um, an absolute um, a huge platform. But uh, rest assured uh, that some of you are uh, extremely knowledgeable of the CLSA and have accessed CLSA data uh, through the existing channels already and are aware. Some of you, maybe that's not the case, but um, uh, we have, there are many resources available online, lots been published, and um, we want to reserve time for lots of Q&A to discuss it. So what is the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or um, commonly known the CLSA? Uh, it is a research platform that is designed, a multidisciplinary research platform um, with a set of national uh, infrastructure 
that uh, is designed to answer questions of today and tomorrow around our aging population um, and to answer as many questions uh, as the platform can conceivably answer. And of course it can answer uh, many questions. It is a important thing is, is it is a longitudinal platform. Um, uh, and I'll go to the next slide, uh, Sophie. Uh, that is a major strategic initiative of CIHR. Uh, planning for the platform began uh, with uh, many individuals, but chiefly um, Parmin Durena, uh, Christina Wolfson, and um, Susan Kirkwood. Kirkland, um, many years ago uh, in 2001, uh, we'll overview sort of some of the dynamics of the cohort here. Um, there are over 160 researchers and collaborators involved across 26 institutions. It is a pan-Canadian platform. Uh, it is multidisciplinary. And so uh, investigators and interest areas and working groups are established um, across biology, genetics, medicine, psychology, sociology, economics, epidemiology, nutrition, and uh, chief of concern today is a little bit around health services. And uh, there are content available that uh, address these domains through various primary data collection strategies that are a part of the platform, which I will overview, uh, all of which provides an extremely exciting base cohort to do research. Uh, and detailed research, and from the perspective of um, health services evaluation, provides an extremely valuable base cohort to do health services research, which is typically the domain of linkage with our uh, administrative health data uh, across jurisdictions. Its largest research platform is kind in Canada, in terms of its breadth and depth, and it's unique internationally uh, in, in that light as well. Uh, the key feature is that it's following over 50,000 individuals uh, that were recruited at age 45 to 85 uh, at baseline 20 years ago in 2011. And so we celebrated uh, a 10-year milestone not long ago. Next slide, please. Uh, two key features to know, and uh, folks who have access to CLSA know this extremely well. Uh, there are two cohorts within the Canadian Longitudinal Study in Aging. Uh, of those individuals, over 50,000 individuals recruited uh, at baseline in uh, 2011. Uh, there's a tracking cohort, and this is uh, just over 21,000 individuals, as you can see, that were recruited from all 10 provinces. And these individuals are followed on a, let's all call it a bit of a lighter protocol uh, through computer assisted telephone interviews or uh, caddy interviews, as we say. Uh, that are conducted at uh, our partner institutions ac um, across the country uh, that are, uh, um, in fact, over but about 60 minutes uh, in length. And uh, this information is available online. We will shortly share links, but many of you are aware of that. Um, but essentially, this covers domains of general health, smoking, your typical age and, and demographic characteristics, cognition, mood, activities of daily living, instrumental activities, social networks, care receiving um, in terms of formal care, formal care, injuries, falls, uh, retirement and labor, retirement planning, hearing vision, I can go on, uh, it's all available online. Um, and so though it's a lighter protocol, it is quite detailed, it's very detailed. The comprehensive cohort uh, is uh, the larger majority of, of, of the CLSA uh, here you see over 30,000 individuals recruited at baseline, and um, these individuals are, are within 25 or 50 kilometers from a CLSA data collection site, uh, which are academic institutions typically um, uh, uh, in, in multiple provinces across the country. And these individuals are followed with the same content as a tracking cohort, but on an expanded set through in-home interviews and uh, uniquely physical assessments and biospecimen collection um, done at these data collection sites. And for these individuals, uh, there is a, a greater commitment in terms of time invested. Um, and of course, we um, always acknowledge the participants who make this study possible uh, and donate their time to, to do this, uh, without which we wouldn't have the CLSA. Uh, and so it's a very exciting platform with a lot of information. You're encouraged to look online and a link was just posted. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is sort of like, a, I, I maybe call this a CLSA tattoo. Folks would be familiar with this. And so it's, um, here we have um, uh, a very nice visual of the, the main mechanisms and, and data collection 
uh, points of the CLSA. So as was mentioned, uh, at 2011, 50, 000, over 50,000 individuals were were, um, were recruited. Uh, there you see on the left, we have the tracking cohort, which are um, followed by questionnaire. On the right, you have um, the, the comprehensive cohort. And as you could see, uh, the main mechanism of the CLSA was at baseline. In about 2011, there was a baseline interview or a sets of data collection rather. And there was a maintaining contact questionnaire in that same period. That 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 is the baseline period and data collection. And then the protocol stipulates um, every three years of follow-up. And so at the moment we are completing follow-up uh, three and bridging into follow-up four. Um, and the study is will will uh, will move forward all the way until 2033. So that's 20 years of, of data collection. Uh, linked data that are available uh, are usable for 20 years thereafter, established in the protocol uh, as a minimum. And uh, uh, information is collected. Uh, uh, the, the link has just been posted on, on on where you can see all the information collected. There's data preview portals on the information that has been collected. Uh, the important thing to mention is that as part of the CLSA protocol, and uh, in fact, there's publications on on the approach to to consent and, and data linkage um, that that we can share. Um, the data linkage was always conceived as part of the protocol, and uh, in the CLSA uh, participants. Uh, were able to consent and provide their health card number uh, for linkage to uh, provincial uh, data centers data through provinces. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, and we don't have the number here, uh, over 92% of CLSA participants did consent to that linkage. And where we have done linkage, we have um, extremely high linkage rates, um, uh, over 99%. Um, and so that provides a, a fantastic mechanism. It's also an important mechanism in the CLSA, uh, as folks are aware, uh, recall bias and issues around health services use uh, is a challenge, particularly where there are three-year follow-ups. And so uh, essentially data linkage provides the ability to understand health service use and those various factors uh, on a very rigorous basis. Next slide, please. And so uh, important to note that uh, the, the CLSA is, is, of course, national in scope, uh, national meaning including the provinces in this case, not, not, not territories in terms of um, participants for data collection. Uh, information on uh, the original recruitment targets and, and methods are, are available uh, and are easily referenced. Um, there you see sort of the sites and a next slide, I believe, um, right? So, the data that are available, I think I overviewed probably appropriately enough. Um, many data are available. It's important to say what's not available. Um, at As part of the national infrastructure at McMaster University, there's a, um, a biorepository and bioanalysis um, site. And of course, those are not available to uh, provincial data centers. Those are uh, in cold storage. Um, so of course, those that's not available. Um, uh, there are information that are being characterized in terms of um, uh, metabolomics and, and genetics that have not been shared. Uh, and information on Indigenous identifiers in the CLSA um, uh, have not been shared with provincial data centers as well. Um, and that is because provincial data centers have their own mechanisms or various mechanisms for collaboration with Indigenous communities. And so that is available on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but what has been shared is, is essentially all alphanumeric very, uh, data that are um, available through the CLSA already um, as part of our um, um, seasonal sort of data collection, uh, data application um, processes uh, to receive data. And so all of that is available all the way up until uh, follow-up to, which is what's available through the CLSA. The plan going forward is that uh, whatever information is available through the CLSA will be available by update from the provincial data centers. And each provincial data center who we have a data sharing agreement will maintain the same data set. And also important to note that within each provincial data center, obviously only a portion of the CLSA data can be linked for citizens residing in that jurisdiction. But that provincial data center maintains the complete copy of the CLSA data, which is available to researchers um, who 
who are having a you know, single region access to linked data, but the CLSA uh, encourages multi-regional access to the data. It is a national platform. Um, and so that's highly encouraged. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, you can have a look online. There are wonderful resources to understand the data. Many of you are very much aware. Uh, this is a good resource to understand essentially what is the data dictionary that, that is available. And um, much has been published on the CLSA, so uh, not many um, surprises. Next slide, please. Okay, I think that's it for uh, the overview. I'll pass it off to Carmen to discuss um, access at provincial data centers. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> um, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's um, session. Um, so we can go back two slides just to the handshake slide, please. Um, so just to start off, in February 2021, um, HR in Canada and yes, CLSA announced a new partnership. Um, and so this partnership aims to streamline uh, requests to link data um, through HR in Canada's um, Data Access Support Hub, also known as DASH. And so this enables the development of data access processes and methodologies that are consistent across different provinces and territories. So ultimately, linking the CLSA data to administrative health databases across provinces um, will enable researchers to make um, important population comparisons um, that will inform healthcare practice and policies over time. Next slide, please. So to, prov uh, to provide a quick overview of Asia in Canada, um, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, presented here is Asia and Canada's strategic framework. Um, Asia and Canada is essentially a distributed network, um, and our mission is to bring together people and organizations across Canada for transformative and world leading um, health data use. And so, one of um, Asia and Canada's main goals is to develop and improve services and support for data access. Um, as a re result, DASH was established in early 2020. Next slide, please. And so um, DASH is a one-stop service um, where researchers can receive guidance on their study design and development and um, request access um, to multi-regional data. And so there are about 13 um, organizations from across Canada who hold data and are part of the DASH network um, and work together to support data requests. Um, DASH helps the facilitation and coordination between research teams and um, the data centers to make the data access um, journey more efficient. So it is important to note that DASH does not hold any data. Um, the data continues to reside um, at the data centers um, and we continue to follow region specific legislation and policies when it comes to data access and relate. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick snapshot of our current member organizations um, where we have <clears throat> data center reps from each data center who can support your data requests within um, the DASH program. Next slide, please. So since the launch of DASH, um, we have developed um, streamlined processes to provide better support and coordination for researchers accessing multi-regional uh, multi data. We've developed um, resources and tools, which I'll touch later on in this presentation. But essentially, over time, these solutions will help further aut um, automate the data access request process. Next slide, please. So as part of um, CLSA and Eastern Canada's partnership, um, a steering committee was created to understand how the CLSA data could be brought into and held at our da uh, DASH data centers, um, but agreements need to be in place for um, data transfers and data linkages, and we develop processes and documented um, standard operating procedures to ensure a seamless data request from researchers. So in terms of the CLSA linked um, data availability, um, currently, this is the status um, at each of our um, DASH data centers. Um, so in BC, they've completed their linkage with a rate of 99.7%. Um, 
in Ontario and New Brunswick, um, linkage is still in, in progress. Um, but these three sites are anticipated to complete um, or to accept data requests um, linked to CLSA data by the end of January. Um, all the other sites except for um, Saskatchewan um, have all started their data sharing agreement process um, and they're all in various stages. For example, in Alberta, the first draft of the, of the data sharing agreement is still um, underway. Whereas in Nova Scotia, um, they've executed their data sharing agreement, but they're still waiting for local approval to transfer data from um, CLSA to um, HDNS. So um, if researchers are looking for um, linked CLSA data to administrative data, there are two routes that they can go through. If they are looking for multi-regional linked data through DASH, um, they would come to DASH. Um, if they just wanted single region um, linked data, they can go directly to the data center that is holding um, the data. So I'll now get into um, how Dash can help you with your multi-regional data request um, involving um, real estate data. So essentially this is um, Dash's uh, process. Um, so in phase one, as a first step, a member of the research team would submit an intake form through our Dash portal. Um, after receiving the intake form, Dash will schedule an intake call with the research team um, to review the information provided in the intake form. Um, and at this stage, we do try to bring in the local Dash reps um, from our data center. Um, to support any initial questions, um, provide some preliminary feedback. Um, and after the intake call, researchers may be asked to um, refine their intake form before proceeding. Um, Dash will then review the intake form and confirm eligibility and feasibility of the project um, and develop cost estimates if requested. Um, when the project is deemed feasible and the researcher um, has confirmed funding and they're ready to um, proceed, then the project would move into the data access request stage, um, also known as the DAR stage. So in this second stage, um, researchers would complete a dash DAR um, through our portal, um, which will then undergo an initial review by our data centers. Um, once the DAR is complete and ready for approvals, um, the DAR will also be sent to CLSA, in which they would have 14 days to reject the approval. Otherwise, the project would um, proceed as usual. Um, DASH and data centers will continue to complete the necessary local reviews um, and approvals, and then start drafting agreements, preparing the data, and then ultimately um, enabling the data access. If applicable, some data centers may um, provide analytical analog services as well. Um, so then in stage three, um, researchers will be able to access um, data as per um, local data center policies. Um, and they would also be reminded to review the CLSA data uh, user responsibility checklist. Once researchers receive the data, um, they would be invoiced by each data center um, they're receiving data from within DASH. And then in addition, um, McMaster University will also issue an invoice on behalf of Steel and Stay. So DASH has developed um, resources that can assist researchers in their initial development of their project. Um, we have the data asset inventory, which is a repository of data assets available at our data centers, and it can be um, request and data can be requested by researchers. Um, so these data assets include administrative data, clinical data, social data, and once CLSA data is available at our data centers, it will be added as a data asset um, as well. So this can be a great resource um, to get a sense of the data available when developing your project. Um, we also have an algorithm inventory, which is another great resource, which um, includes information from systematic reviews to identify published algorithms for measures of population health, 
um, health service use and the determinants of health. Um, all of these algorithms included um, in the inventory have been validated or tested for feasibility um, of implementation in two or more Canadian provinces and territories. We also have the COVID-19 um, data inventory, which includes information about the availability of COVID-19 uh, related data uh, resources at our data centers. Um, we have an informed consent page that provides uh, rich information and guidelines for uh, researchers who are looking to conduct um, research that involves consent and or are currently designing consent forms. We also have um, the privacy checklist that outlines requirements needed for um, data sharing agreements. Um, and so we do encourage researchers to browse these resources um, before coming to DASH. Um, all of these resources have been um, developed by um, DASH collaborating with all of the different data centers. So one of um, Dash's greatest assets is that we've built the Dash portal, which is a, uh, a web platform that houses um, forms that researchers will need to complete through the data access process. Um, so these centralized forms were designed to take the burden off of researchers by reducing the need to complete multiple forms across different data centers. And so using a collaborative space allows for the data centers to work together to ensure um, data and service availability, as well as data um, comparability. So the intake form um, will ask basic questions about your project, um, like what services you're looking for, what your timelines for data access are, what regions you're interested in obtaining data from. Um, that way, DASH can provide you with a, a feasibility assessment and cost estimate for your project. We then go into building the data assembly plan. Um, some of the information collected in the intake form will feed into the project's data assembly plan. Um, this tool allows researchers and data centers to collaborate and document um, centrally um, the project's data requirements, um, their analytical plan, which will eventually inform um, local data creation plans. And then we have the data access request. So um, this new DASH form allows researchers to complete one single data access request form um, when requesting data from multiple provinces. So one caveat right now is that projects that involve KIHI or SATSCAN um, data, um, researchers would still be directed to complete separate forms for those requests. Um, however, the DASH DAR is a big step forward in reducing the number of um, DAR forms that need to be completed. So the DAR form um, builds on previous information that DASH has collected for your project. Um, and you will also be asked to obtain and attach um, relevant supplementary documents such as ethics approval, consent forms if applicable, um, funding letters, um, that are all needed for uh, review and approval of the project. And so these forms are all integrated with each other. And so information that was provided um, in the intake form will downstream into the DAR if relevant. Um, we are continuing to enhance the forms and the portal in general to further streamline and automate the process. So um, for those who may be interested in requesting CLSA linked data through DASH, um, we invite you to complete the following steps to initiate the process. Um, once DASH receives your intake form, we aim to conduct the intake meeting um, within five business days of receiving your form. Um, once we have everything we need, we can provide you with a feasibility assessment within two to four weeks. Um, but also to note that timelines may vary depending on the readiness of um, the research team to meet, um, as well as the complexity of the project. Um, so if you do have any questions along the way, um, you can always contact DASH directly and we'd be happy to support you through your DASH journey. So now I'll pass it on to Lindsay to speak 
um, about the single site experience. Thank you, Carmen. Hi, everyone. I won't take too much time. I know I'm excited to get to the Q&A, as I'm sure everyone is. Uh, but as a participating data center in New Brunswick, I would like to highlight today some of the things that, from our perspective, have helped make this data sharing partnership so successful. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so the first one is that the project felt uh, to us to be truly collaborative. And uh, I mean that. It felt like a true partnership in that HDRN, CLSA, and the data centers were hands-on uh, throughout the whole journey of coordinating agreement review, developing and reviewing standard operating procedures, um, and just being available for meetings and troubleshooting issues along the way. Um, I definitely found there was a lot of give and take with making our respective processes work uh, to make this project uh, move forward. In addition to HDRN data centers and CLSA, of course, having a lot of opportunity over the course of the project to learn from each other. From my perspective, there was also an added benefit of the data centers learning from each other. And for me, uh, I know that learning a lot of through the Health Data Research Network uh, happens all the time, but being involved in a specific initiative uh, like this one has really helped me apply the information that I learned uh, and think about how we could be doing things differently, uh, which was very beneficial uh, to our team. And finally, consistent standing meetings uh, with a focus on action items. I found that was really key for this project, uh, even when we felt like we were stuck uh, on a piece of the initiative. Uh, but that being said, we did adjust the frequency of the meetings that we had together according to the phase of the project that we were in. Uh, so we know that early reviews can take longer, so meetings could be less frequent, uh, but we made sure to increase uh, frequency of our collaboration uh, to make things move faster uh, once we were ready to do process development and actually transfer the data uh, into each data center. And on the next slide, um, I'll just go through uh, a few of the lessons uh, that we learned uh, from being part of this project. The first, of course, is to always include plenty of time for legal review in project timelines. Andrew alluded to the data sharing agreements that we completed, and I have to say that was definitely a very large portion uh, of the work that we did uh, in the beginning. Uh, it was very intensive. There's nearly always more back and forth than you think there will be. Um, and in addition to agreement negotiation, when there are so many organizations on board, um, almost everyone uh, had to uh, deal with some sort of unforeseen challenge, uh, such as legal counsel turnover, uh, changes within their organization, competing local priorities, uh, all kinds of things that uh, made things go a little bit more slowly uh, than anticipated. And as a uh, you know, just uh, working on such a big project like this together with so many different data centers, we found that it was easier to make one person at each organization responsible for communicating within their site and then reporting on status and getting everything together to come back to the central group. Um, so even if uh, there were multiple teams within a data center that we worked on for different portions of the data sharing, uh, we made sure that we had that central point of contact uh, to be the common thread uh, throughout. Uh, maybe sounds obvious, but it really helped us. Another thing we did was mapping out data flows in advance. So if you're thinking about going through an initiative like this, uh, we find especially having access to visual data flow diagrams really helps clarify how each data center receives and links data sets. Uh, everyone here probably <laughs> I can appreciate uh, that it's been a complex journey, um, especially when you compare multiple organizations uh, at once. Uh, so having a visual is really helpful there. We also shared uh, some key processes along the way for data access approval, receiving data, linking data, uh, to help us find some commonalities that we could start with um, in creating an approval process, um, which uh, meant that we really didn't have to start completely from scratch. Um, if we did the project again, I think there would be opportunities to do this in a more streamlined way up front. So that's a key lesson that we learned. Um, but some of the uh, comparisons that we did as part of this work, um, which was uh, quite novel, um, it allowed us to create procedures and, and other things that will be helpful, I believe, for future multi-regional data sharing initiatives. Also, uh, we observed that common understanding of terminology is huge. I can't overstate that. 
um, taking a step back and establishing common terminology in the beginning can save a lot of confusion. Uh, for example, we learned that through the, even though the data centers uh, use a lot of the same words to describe data and processes, uh, the differences in meaning can actually be pretty significant. A special shout out there to the word linkage. Who knew that you could use that word in so many ways? Uh, we found out that you can. Finally, uh, I wanted to highlight this piece last. Uh, not every organization's procedural details had to be exactly the same to make this collaboration successful. Um, and I wanted to point that out because I think uh, for people thinking about participating in an initiative like this, it can seem very daunting uh, to reconcile all these different needs. Um, I think there can be a fear. Uh, I know there was maybe on, on our side that such radical changes uh, would need to be needed uh, to uh, ever be able to participate, uh, but we just didn't find that to be true. Um, even though collaboratively building our approach, uh, starting with our, our processes as all of the data centers were helpful, I think more importantly, um, we were able to always make sure that we returned to the big picture and assess what we really needed to accomplish and then determine common outcomes out of that uh, that we would need to reach and then figure out how we can use our own processes to get there um, and meet in those common points along the way. Uh, this is a strategy that um, the Dash team uses quite a lot as well, um, and we find it very effective. And uh, I have to say CLSA was wonderful to work with um, in uh, making these things happen. So those are some of our lessons learned. Uh, there are many more, uh, but for now, I'll hand it over uh, to Andrew to link things up. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. And so in conclusion, um, we want to acknowledge um, the CIHR and the CFI who uh, fund uh, the CLSA, um, as well as the Government of Canada and our supportive network of uh, provincial governments and universities that make the platform possible, um, and clearly HDRN, who without which um, this would not be possible. And of course, HDRN includes uh, just a, a variety of provincial data centers and 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 similar groups uh, and federal centers as well across the country. Um, and I think Lindsay overviewed it extremely well in terms of how that process went and um, it was fantastic. We also wanna thank the McMaster Collaborative for Health and Aging uh, and their funder, the Ontario Spore Support Unit who supported some critical early work uh, in Ontario that that provided a little bit of a framework to get started. Uh, so we acknowledge that that was instrumental. We have time for questions. I know there's questions in the chat. Um, just to note that uh, we won't, we may not get to all questions, but all questions will be answered and sent and shared. Um, uh, please do uh, include your questions. Um, we uh, we oftentimes only get to sort of uh, helpful answers when we have strict scenarios that you can maybe provide, and so feel free to do that. Um, and we'll. We'll, we'll get to those questions now. Uh, I'm seeing one already, um, well, more than one, from Helen. Uh, and the question is, time taken for researchers to gain access to linked data? Uh, of course, a, 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 an ongoing concern that uh, uh, it can take years to get approval to access data. And I'm sure it depends on the jurisdiction and do you anticipate the same for the CLSA linked data? And so data access is a little bit different across provinces. Um, before I answer this specifically, just to highlight to the group, um, CLSA data with unlinked data, or rather uh, not linked to provincial uh, repositories is, is, is more precise, is available through the CLSA. Linked data to provincial repositories is not available through the CLSA through the regular data access mechanism. It is available, as Carmen mentioned, if you only want single jurisdiction linked data through that jurisdiction's um, data center, through their existing process, and for multi-regional data through um, the HDRN dash process that was mentioned that facilitates access. And so Carmen overviewed the steps, and essentially it is um, a federated and coordinated set of steps when you're looking for multi-region linked data. Uh, through through Dash. And so we anticipate that, that could be a little bit longer than single region data. Uh, unfortunately for um, 
for the CLSA, for the researchers who want to access data, and oftentimes even for the data centers themselves, uh, they do not always have uh, complete control over their time processes because their processes are changing and sometimes can change according to changes in legislation and how, uh, particularly the privacy legislation. Uh, it's an ongoing concern around speedy access to the resource, but it is quite a resource. And so um, I would just offer to say that it, it's worth the wait. Um, I, th I think we hope that these uh, processes are, are will continue to improve over time. Uh, so not a great answer there um, uh, in terms of uh, exact time frames because unfortunately they're not warranted. Um, or rather, uh, we, we can't warrant a particular time frame. Uh, where can we find data flow maps? Um, you can find data flow maps on the websites uh, for the CLSA that was um, shared. Uh, that information is widely available. And then in particular domains of interest, there's um, uh, typically always a lot published already on the CLSA. Um, with respect to the HDRN, what data are available on uh, the provincial side that for linkage, those are available through the provincial data centers, but also HDRN has wonderful resources around what data are available across regions, including um, uh, algorithms that you can compare. Is the linked data free for graduate students? Great question. Um, the CLSA, uh, as folks might be aware, provides um, uh, uh, for graduate students, um, and you can find this on the website in detail, um, a uh, no cost uh, access. Uh, otherwise, there is a, a, a data fee, um, and the the CLSA waives that that fee um, for where graduate students are accessing linked data for their thesis projects within provincial data centers. Um, but the provincial data centers uh, do not provide free access to those data for graduate students is, is typical. Uh, and they do not because there are um, particular hosting costs and the, the mechanism for which, if folks are not familiar, data are used across provincial data centers is with um, a high degree of security, usually on secure portals and, and very, very often, if not exclusively facilitated by an intermediary uh, expert data analyst that is has access to the data um, uh, um, securely. Of course, these these modify and change over time and can, and, and of course we would, uh, so we, we could see changes there. So contact your local data center or be in touch with HDR and Dash, I think is the answer there. Any um, thoughts from panelists on any of my responses so far? Okay, there's a comment um, on um, following up on a New Brunswick's experience and um, why they decided to request the data, uh, who paid for the data and what's the progress of the data analysis. And so um, I'll try to clarify. And so, um, the, as part of the CLSA protocol, data linkage was always uh, expected, and it's uh, and it is uh, optional uh, for participants to consent to data linkage, which the the vast majority have. Um, to facilitate that, um, then we, because uh, health services data is uh, held under provincial jurisdiction under provincial privacy legislation, therefore. Uh, the CLSA data must go to the provincial, um, uh, the provincial centers rather than the provincial center data coming to the CLSA, um, and so uh, as part of HDRN's activities and CLSA's mandate, uh, that's how this uh, relationship came to be and 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 the good outcomes to date. Um, who paid for the data? Uh, essentially, the, the CLSA has a mandate to for data linkage, and so. Um, it was supported instrumentally through people time across HDRN, the data centers, um, includes Kai High and, and ourselves in the CLSA. What's the progress of the data analysis? Um, the data are are linked in centers where are that are available. So are three, there are three jurisdictions to date. Um, uh, as you saw, more will be added as data sharing agreements conclude and data are shared. Um, some in the next in the next few months. Uh, and so um, uh, you can reference the uh, 
the, the various websites to understand what data are available at any given time. Um, and the uh, the data analyses, so the data are linked and they're, they are available in those centers. Uh, so they're available to researchers to do uh, uh, research uh, under the rules of conducting research in, in provincial data centers. And so uh, those analyses will now uh, begin. Um, and so we expect that researchers will access those data um, build proposals to access those data separately within the mandate of the CLSA and um, and um, our support for the platform through CIHR and CFI, we're considering um, the possibility of conducting methodological analyses across centers over time in order to um, provide researchers with a greater sense around the possible questions that they can answer. Uh, this is um, an ongoing consideration. So for example, where uh, uh, some analyses might be able to understand where uh, the CLSA cohort uh, is at in terms of transitions across housing environments into long-term care environments and so forth so that researchers can understand the representative or, or the, let's call it the penetration rate of the CLSA cohort as they uh, evolve throughout the, the lifespan, uh, how, where they're represented in various provincial data. Um, but we expect, of course, they're obviously available in provincial data that has to do with hospitalizations, primary care visits, um, medications, et cetera. Um, Andrew, I just saw some uh, questions in the Q&A on the same topic. And just to clarify for the recording and everyone, um, the analyses um, will have to be done separately in each province if you're making a multi-region request. So that's one point. And then secondly, the mechanism to access the data will depend on each province. And there's some links that have been posted in the Q&A to show you um, which, um, whether it's secure access, a secure access environment for the researcher to do the analysis themselves, or exclusively, exclusively an analyst at the data center who does the analysis for you. Um, it will depend on the data center, how that mechanism of getting the access to the data and how they prepare the data set for you. Um, yeah, so just wanted to clarify that because there were a few questions about that. Yeah, I think Sophia is great. There's a question on the kinds of data that could potentially be obtained from participant medical records. Uh, just important to note that um, the the available records at provincial data centers are oftentimes not like um, electronic medical record data. Um, people should be aware of that. They're typically abstract or what we generally call administrative data, which is that they're typically procured through, although not exclusively, sort of funding mechanisms. So where the province funds um, a drug plan, then a receipt of which of which um, drugs are funded for which individuals uh, go into a repository, or there are abstract level data from discharges from hospitals. Those are typically available across provinces. Uh, have a look at the HDRN site where you can see across jurisdictions what data sets are available. And of course, they're all in uh, regular use, so you can see examples of published work from those data sets uh, quite easily. And then uh, each provincial data center uh, on their website would also have helpful, helpful resources around various data dictionaries and what information can be accessed. Jennifer, I might just jump in um, on some of the, the questions in the chat. So um, I, I, I want to address uh, the question about the length of time and, and um, just uh, as I said in the, in the answer in the Q&A, um, part of HDRN's Canada's reason for being is to um, streamline and harmonize both data access processes across our, our member organizations, but also um, to uh, harmonize data itself. So, so these these two areas, we appreciate the, the comment about the length of time. Um, but uh, both these areas are, are, are ones where there is active 
um, you know, thought work, uh, engagement with sites on, on how to continuously improve. So I just want to reassure folks that, that this is something that we are aware of and that we are working on. Um, in terms of the questions around um, accessing data, so we there there are uh, very good uh, resources on our website about the requirements across the different sites, but generally um, most sites have secure access environments um, and many of them are remote access. Um, if, if sites do not have remote access at the moment, they are working on getting remote access. So basically all of our sites are moving towards uh, remote access into secure environments. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, in recognition of, um, you know, the need for capacity building around advanced methods in federated analysis, um, HCR in Canada has planned, uh, uh, with in collaboration with others, a federated analysis learning series. So I put that um, also in the chat. It's on our website. Um, it, it's a great opportunity to uh, learn from folks who are uh, more expert in this area, but also um, there's a desire to hear from people about uh, you know, where the sort of interests and needs are and and sort of maintain this learning series going forward. So it'll be very much an engaging sort of um, learning series that will lead to more uh, opportunities going forward. So those are just some things I wanted to highlight. Great. Um Andrew, I see we've got another couple of minutes and there's one last question. So perhaps uh, you or one of the panelists can uh, address the question from Jennifer Lawson and then I can can wrap things up. Yeah, I'll comment briefly. And, and if someone else wants to, that's great. I think um, what's been gained in terms of uh, all this work um, uh, procedurally, I think basically just the muscle memory of doing it. It was a gargantuan feat. And uh, we prove principle that it is possible. And there are many small steps and hurdles to, to reach that. And we were able to achieve it and we continue to be able to achieve it. For me, that's it. Maybe others have a comment. Concluding remarks for many of the panelists. And uh, there was also the last question squeaked in about um, whether uh, the Pan Canadian Genome Library will uh, be part of, of the linkage. I'm not aware, so we may have to okay. follow up, Andrew. All right, great. Okay. Well, I see the uh, I see some some nice general comments coming in and congratulating everyone. So maybe this is a a good time to end and and congratulate everyone on a a great webinar. And this has been a uh, tremendous feat for uh, the CLSA and and all the collaborators who we've been. Um, working with on. So thank you again for to all of you who presented or were behind the scenes helping answer questions. Uh, we really appreciate your participation in these webinars. They're, they're greatly valued by the our researchers and participants.